Jesus was an example in everything to us. He didn't just say, here's the leadership principles. He lived the leadership principles. And you and I have those leadership principles in the Word of God. Welcome back to Loving Fearlessly. And I actually am super, super honored to be able to dive into these questions. This is my home, this is my world, and I want you to feel like we're just sitting across from a sofa or a chair and we are in a conversation. And that is such a privilege to me that you would open up your heart and invite me in to actually talk about these things. So this one was kind of a reoccurring theme. And I actually, I actually really am gonna take some time on this question. This woman said to me, what advice would you give to a woman married to an unbeliever who is the sole spiritual leader of the home. So I think what she's saying is, my husband's an unbeliever, and that makes me the sole spiritual leader in the home. What would you say to me? And first of all, I know that's not an easy situation, but I think that sometimes we mistake what it means to be a leader. So I want to redefine this term leader, and then I'm hoping as we redefine the term leader, then you'll have this insight on how to navigate this. One of my favorite quotes uh, that defines, in my opinion, leadership so well is John Quincy Adams' quote. He says, if your actions inspire others to dream more, learn more, do more, and become more, you are a leader. So what does that just mean? It says, if your actions inspire other people, if your actions and praise them to dream more, do more, become more. You are a leader. So that's saying something to me right now. The actions means example. If the way you live your life speaks to your husband, that he can dream more, that he can be more, that he can become more, that he can do more. If he's saying that to your children, then you're an example. And I think a lot of times we feel pressure. Oh, I'm a leader. I've got to come up with a plan you live as an example. Jesus was an example in everything to us. He didn't just say, here's the leadership principles. He lived the leadership principles. And you and I have those leadership principles in the word of God. So I'm going to challenge you to lead as an example. And again, none of these are easy things. What do we hear in 1 Peter chapter 3? I'm going to read verses 1 through 6. It says, likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands so that even if some do not obey the word, an unbeliever is not going to obey the word. But even sometimes believers don't obey the word. So God is saying, I'm going to make him provisions. I'm going to tell you how to position this. So even if your husband doesn't believe the word or he doesn't obey the word, this is what I'm going to be able to do for you. He says, they may be one without a word. So you don't have to convince them. You don't have to argue with them. One without a word by the conduct of their wives. That means your example. That means your actions. When they see your respectful and pure conduct, not seductive, not looking at other men, respecting, respecting the leader you wish they were instead of making them feel bad or less than what they are. Instead of being like, I got to be the spiritual leader because you're a spiritual loser. You have to understand people actually grow into what we show them. So if you're respectful, you don't have to respect his doctrine or his theology if he doesn't understand, but respect him as a husband, respect him as a a son of God. So you respect him. And it says, pure kind. And it says, do not let your adorning be external. Now, so many people are like, that means I'm naked. That means I'm like, but he's saying merely external. External, the braiding of hair, the putting on of gold jewelry, or the clothing you wear. He's saying, don't put your trust in those things. Don't think if I can make myself look beautiful, if I can wear these kind of clothes, if I do these things and I'm attractive, he's saying, that's good. That's not what's going to win him. It's your conduct. It's your pure conduct. It's your respect. And then he goes on to say, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart well, and the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. And then he goes on to say, I'm going to give you like 
help on this, for this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. It's frightening when we read to submit to a man that is not following God. That's frightening. Abraham was like, hey, go in this harem. Hey, go in that harem. Say you're my, bro you're my sister, that we're brother and sister. No, that was frightening. But God went into Abimelech, gave him a nightmare. And then the other time it got exposed. So you need to be able to understand God isn't putting you in a bad situation that is just like, oh, because your husband's not saved, you need to get divorced. He's saying, I believe your husband's going to be won by your conduct. And again, I'm not talking about abusive situations. I'm talking about good men who love their family, but just haven't found Jesus as their Lord and Savior yet. So we want to we want to see that change. And sometimes people get married and get one of them gets saved afterwards. So I don't know what your situation. So it can even be scary submitting to a godly husband. So I can only imagine what it's like to submit to a ungodly. But let's talk about what this word submission means. Because submission has been so distorted. And if I'm telling you to submit to a godly or an ungodly, I better tell you what submission means. Submission means sub, which means under. So under. Mission, which means assignment. It means that you have an assignment on your family. You have an assignment on your marriage. You have an assignment given by God. The first time we actually see this assignment given expression, we see it in the book of Genesis. When God looks at Adam and Eve and he tells them, be fruitful, multiply, order the chaos, have dominion. He gives them an assignment. So this is about God empowering you on your assignment. There is something inside of you that God is saying, I believe that the assignment on you and the assignment on your husband, I can actually get involved with this. So he's saying, when we define submission, we're not talking about doormats. We're not talking about you not having a voice. We're having you be wise with your voice. And you say, what is the mission? Sit down with your husband and say, I wanna love you better. Your husband's not gonna be like, that's a horrible mission. He's gonna be like, I love that mission. We already talked about having those conversations. You can have a mission. We wanna raise children who are godly. Most husbands aren't gonna say, I want ungodly kids. No, they're gonna be okay with godly kids. Obedient, they're not gonna say, I want disobedient kids. Respectful, he isn't gonna say, I want disrespectful kids. You can sit down, what do we wanna do with our money? How do we wanna build legacy? How do we wanna pay for our children's college? How do we want to do family right now? You can have conversations without opening up your Bible that are biblical and godly and good stewardship. And so I just want to talk to you about this. I'm not asking you to be a relational doormat. I'm not asking you to not have an opinion. I'm asking you to be wise with how you share. Genesis 1:28. just in case you're wondering, it says, God bless them and God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, and every living thing that moves on the earth. So God wants there to be dominion. Dominion means to exercise authority on behalf. As a daughter of the Most High God, as somebody who knows the truth, you have the right to exercise spiritual authority, to pray for your husband, to pray over your children, to have dominion, to say on the behalf of other people, I'm going to exercise my spiritual authority. I'm going to exercise my wisdom, my virtue, my strength. I'm going to do this to create an environment for my husband to flourish, and then he's gonna experience the goodness of God because he's got a virtuous, capable, godly wife. And my children are gonna be flourished because God says that your children are actually his children. So that's awesome. You don't need to worry about that so much. He's like, because of your sake, because you said I'm gonna love God, you and your children is what we have from Acts 16, 34, shall be saved. So there's a gatekeeper anointing on your life. And I wanna challenge you, I know it's not easy. I know it's not something I've ever walked in, but there's provision in the word of God that talks about this ahead of time. The book of Malachi 2.14 says, do you know why? He's saying, he's talking to them about mistreating their wives. He said, do you know why I'm not answering your prayers? Because you've mistreated your wife of your youth. And he said, simple, because God was there as a witness when you spoke your marriage vows to your young bride. So 
even though you're like, mm, my husband wasn't saved. No, God, when we get married, it's covenant, not just between two people. It's between two people and their heavenly father because he's the one that makes us one. When you spoke your marriage vows to your young brother and now you've broken those vows, broken the faith bond with your va vowed companion, your covenant wife, God not you made marriage. So this is God's promise. His spirit inhabits even the smallest details of marriage. And what does he want from your marriage? Children of God, that's what. So guard the spirit of your marriage within you and don't cheat on your spouse. So marriage isn't just about reproducing and having natural children. It's a catalyst to make us children of God. The hard things, the good things, the iron sharpening iron, it makes us more of a child of God. God wants your husband and you to have the fullness of everything. He wants your husband saved even more than you do. So you just do your part. And I believe that God's going to follow up and do his.